Praise God. Let's go to God's word in prayer as we look at this course on spiritual authority and church structure. It's a specialized course. Let's go to God in a prayer. Father, we praise you and thank you for this time as we gather together in your name. We thank you, Father, that your Holy Spirit is in our midst. We pray, O God, that you cause us to understand the realm of authority, that we may function, that we may move in it. And Father, we, we glorify you. And we ask, O God, that you cause us to rise in our spiritual authority, that we would understand that realm and flow in that realm, that we would be people both submitted and both functioning in authority. And may your authority that is inherent in the name of Jesus Rain and flow through our lives, Father. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Let's look in the Bible. And uh, first of all, let's look at some of uh, uh, some incidents that are in the book of Genesis. Noah, when he came out from the flood. Chapter 9 of Genesis. If we look at spiritual authority, we need to understand that spiritual authority... Uh, rises from three areas. There are certain things and how it rises and how to maintain it. And uh, spiritual authority can be number one, inherited, number two, delegated, and number three, acquired. And uh, to inherit is to, is to uh, receive it based on uh, uh, our lineage with the one previously. Usually it's Usually it talks about uh, uh, family line or uh, blood line or name line or there's a linkage to the previous one who have authority. And so it can be inherited. Just like Isaac, he inherited his whole father's uh, uh, tents and all the property and all the servants, everything automatically went over to Isaac. That is the authority that was passed to him by inheritance. There was an old servant there, the same one who got uh, Isaac his wife, if you remember that story. By right, if, uh, if there were no children, if Abraham didn't have any children, then automatically uh, the whole thing may be dispersed to the older servant. But because there was a special gift of a child called Isaac, that authority and property and all that is inherent became his. It is inherited authority. Of course, Isaac would then take control when Abraham died. And uh, that is uh, an inheritance that is passed on. Sometimes in a case where you have two children, and we're talking in the Bible area, right? Nothing to do with today. We have to apply it later. Uh, like Jacob and Esau. By natural birth, Esau was supposed to have the inheritance and the inherited authority. But somehow, he lost it because he, he did not respect it. He did not uh, value it. So even though we, we may inherit authority, if we don't value it, we can lose it. It can come by inheritance. Number two, it can come by delegation. Uh, an authority can come upon a person because they have received a command they have received a, uh, uh, an appointment, uh, sometimes God, sometimes another person. Like for example, the prophet Elisha. He actually came to the scene much later than some other prophets. Elijah was already you know, uh, uh, a successful prophet. And uh, then he had to a certain extent a school of prophets that was there in existence since the time of uh, Samuel. And uh, Elijah used to be alone and uh, he seems to be prominent among this school of prophets. And God told him in 1 Kings 19 to go and select Elisha to follow after him. Uh, Elijah happened to be single. Uh, story may be different if he was married but we don't have... Uh, uh, is married so uh, somebody has to receive the authority of the school of prophets after Elijah died um, praise God oh, I won't like I won't go to the other topic of marriage and single we wait for the next term 
when my wife con- my wife started the course, so I'll continue the course in a third term, mm, prob- most probably. And uh, so we are talking about Elijah and Elijah. Elijah had no blood relationship, no bloodline, no linkage at all to Elijah. But he was delegated the authority. You notice in the book of Second Kings, chapter three. Uh, chapter 2, when he came back from the Jordan, crossed the Jordan, the sons of the prophets said that Elijah's spirit was upon Elisha. And immediately they submitted to him. They submitted to his authority. Now that authority came about in the Bible by appointment and anointment, if you want to put it that way. To make it a little bit more poetic. <laughs> so, appointment and anointment. If there's such an English word, my English is sometimes strange. <laughs> now, uh, uh, there, were, there are two things necessary for delegated authority. The third area, how authority can come upon a person, is what we would call uh, acquired authority. In other words, you earn it by knowledge and by work. You have skill, knowledge, or you were successful in a particular work. In the Bible, spiritual authority will be spiritual work. Like for example, where did Elijah get his authority? Nobody passed it to him. He suddenly came out of the blue and said that he was Elijah the Tishbite. Where did he get his authority? We know from the book of James chapter 5 that he started as a tremendous intercessor. And he grew as an intercessor and uh, became a mighty prophet. In fact, he became the main prophet that challenged all the hidden gods in his days. There was Elijah rising forth in a a third category of authority that we call uh, acquired authority. He acquired it through spiritual exploits. He started as a nobody. But when he stopped the rain for three years, everybody was now going to listen to him. He was nobody, but when he wrote a mighty work, he gained, he acquired the authority through his prayer. We know from James chapter 5, which we have covered and taught, so we're not repeating here, that uh, it's because he was successful in his prayer life. And he asked God, according to James, for, for the rain to stop. And God gave him the right. It was hard work, spirit, hard spiritual work to get a level of authority. And uh, just, uh, we, we're still building up until, we, I haven't forgotten Genesis chapter 9. And uh, those three realms of authority, you need to understand as a background, as we look into it. Because in the New Testament, all three authorities must function when a person stands in an office. Because some people, if they stand in an office, they've got only one area, they are not going to succeed in the New Testament. If this is New Testament, not Old Testament. Let me quote an example, like Acts chapter 6, when they appointed the seven deacons. Number one, those seven deacons already have their own gifting. They were born again and they were born of Jesus Christ. They had a lineage to Jesus. So God has already gifted them. We know that the Bible tells us that uh, these are gifts and ministries of God. And the ministry of diaconia, the word deacon, the Greek word diaconia, D-I-A-K-O-N-I-A, is the same Greek word that is mentioned in Romans chapter 12, where it talks about the ministry of, uh, the, of, of a servant. Of, of, uh, one of the ministries of a deacon that we touch on in the ministry of believers. So that is a gifting of God. A gifting that came when we were born again. We were called that an inherited authority. We inherit it because we are born of Jesus Christ. It is the gift of Jesus Christ. A gift is not something that you work for. It is free gift from Him. Because of our bloodline. Born again by the precious blood of Jesus. We are all relations of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Through the precious blood. He's our elder brother. We are all in the family of God. So they have inherit, inherited authority. And based on their function, their inherited authority, you notice, 
uh, number two, that in the book of Acts chapter 6, those seven deacons have what we would qualify as a quiet authority. You see, the church was told, go and select seven people who are of good reputation, good work, filled with the Holy Ghost. In other words, they are going to look for people who have already been tested, people who have been already successful in the spiritual ministry. They're not going to look for people to train. They're going to look for people to appoint. That's different. Jesus, in the beginning of the Gospels, looked for people to train. But in Acts 6, they looked for people to appoint. So they told the church, the apostles told the church, go and, and see, seek among yourselves people filled with the Spirit, a good reputation, in other full of good works, people who were successful, people who had acquired fame in their own context. They may not be famous outside of the, of the church in Jerusalem, but they are people within their home fellowship, fellowships, within the house group, that know them. The word reputation means well-known. Right? The word reputation is the word related to fame. What kind of fame? They were well-known for their work. They have acquired a measure of spiritual success. Perhaps known for their prayer life, known, from the, known for the word, known for good work. Some area that they were known in. They have acquired an established standing. During that time, nobody appointed them. Nobody sent them in a sense except if you want to say Jesus Christ. So they have acquired a certain measure of spiritual authority. And then number three, they became appointed. They have what we call delegated authority. When the apostles appointed them. And you notice that they had already got two. But when the third was added, their ministry burst out. And so as we understand spiritual authority, sometimes a person is functioning in an area of spiritual authority, uh, one area of spiritual authority. But when more areas are added, their ministries multiply and burst forth. And there are different keys and different rules uh, to move into all these three realms of authority. Different keys, different rules. And to understand these rules, we need to look at Genesis 9. Now we get to read it. Right? I hope you have found it by now. It's taken us a long time to get to Genesis 9. You didn't bring your New Testament, uh, Old Testament tonight. Please uh, look over at somebody who has an Old Testament. Book, book of Genesis chapter 9. <clears throat> Let's look at verse 18. The place where we will understand authority is in the home. That's the main place where we understand authority. Because if a person does not know how to wield his authority at home, he will never need, know how to do it in the church. Which are among the qualifications of bishop, elders and deacons. Do you notice? Among the qualifications, they always mention that they must be a, of good reputation in their own home. Their children must be in submission. They must have respect in their own home. And you will notice this. A person who is a tyrant in the home will be a tyrant in their church and in their working place. No different. We call it Sama Sama. Exactly the same. The way they behave in the home, the way they behave in the church. And you watch a person function. How they relate to their children. If they are like Pharaoh to the children, right? The adults are like Pharaoh to the children, watch it. Perhaps you will have to make a decision to employ such a person. Watch it. That fellow is going to be a tyrant to your workers. And perhaps you, you may have to make a decision to uh, appoint a person in the church ministry. Watch out. After some time, the person will be a tyrant to the other church people. That's why the Bible says the home is where the test of a person's authority is. If they don't know how to function in that, they will never learn to function in authority. If a person is weak in authority, right? Like some husbands, they are not spiritual leaders in their own home. They are weak. Jellyfish. Children run wild. 
Children decide what to do in the home. Go by voting. If you go by voting and you have 12 kids, they will always outvote you. For breakfast, they all vote ice cream. How are you going to vote if everyone has a vote? Right? You will lose out. And so, has no control over the family. That's the opposite extreme of the tyrant. That is jellyfish. You put the person there in a place they would not know how to control or wield the rod of authority in a proper manner. It's interesting that in the ministry and in authority we have to function at two extremes. You have to wield on one hand you know, uh, mercy, on the other hand, judgment. Think about that. Mercy is only possible if you're in authority. Who can dispense mercy? The one who has authority to dispense just, 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 justice or judgment. Who can give the mercy? The one who dispenses the same judgment. In other words, uh, a person who has the ability and authority to do something to you and don't do it, that's mercy. So mercy and judgment are the two main forces that one who stands in authority must balance. If you lean too much to the judgment side and you neglect mercy, your authority is like a tyrant. If you lean too much to mercy and you neglect uh, judgment, it will be just like trying to run society without punishing robbers. When somebody robs, anybody kills, murder, anything happens, you know, never mind, you know, you know, uh, mercy, never mind, just, just go free. And uh, they, they went out and they killed another 10 guys, sick, and you bring them back, naughty, naughty, and then... Then they run out again. What kind of society will you run? Huh? You run a very lawless society where there's no judgment, no punishment. No, we've got to lock those guys out who, who willfully, continually are in disobedience. And so, uh, there's a balance between mercy and justice. All this starts in a home. Now, how do we tell whether uh, someone knows how to exercise authority and whether someone knows how to uh, uh, abide by authority in the home? It's in the home where you watch and you test out how well people will function when they receive authority. At the same time, in the home is where you can watch out and test how well a person is able to receive authority. Unless we are contrite and we are able to use the authority, we will never be able to exercise authority. Let's look at Genesis chapter 9 in verse 18. Now the sons of Noah who went out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Jephthah. And Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah and from these the whole earth was populated. Now Noah began to be a farmer and he planted a vineyard. Then he drank of the wine and was drunk and became uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told the two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned away and they did not see their father's nakedness. So Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done to him. This is a very strange story. But in this story, we learn about authority. Ham was the younger son and here, Japheth was the oldest. And uh, in this particular story, Noah had made a mistake. We do not say that Noah did not make a mistake. He did not sin or anything. He did. He should not have got himself drunk. That was a mistake. An error, a blotch in his life. 
Or when you read stories like that, you realize it has to be God who writes the Bible. Because if those men wrote the Bible themselves, they would never record that. They record all the nice things. And when you read, they look like real heroes. But when God get, has His Spirit recording, they record both the, their, their success and their failures that we may learn to avoid their failures and to follow their success. Here in the book of Genesis 9, no one made a mistake. But here is the other point of that story. Ham also made a mistake. Two mistakes do not make a right. Two wrongs do not make a right. It's just like a decision people have in, for example, abortion. For example, uh, you know, out of certain crime or sin or something that has happened, and let's say an uh, a, a legitimate uh, child is being extracted. So whatever circumstances, innocent or guilty, a child is being extracted from a girl. What do you do? You can never, God forbid, have any abortion. Abortion. The reason is, it will be another wrong to correct a wrong. And that makes it worse. So, it seems like that. Two wrongs never make a right. But if there's a wrong, the test of authority is this. If everybody is very good, if nobody makes mistakes, if nobody fall or stumble or fall into sin, and everybody lives righteously, holy, holy, I mean all like angels, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning a song shall rise to thee, until evening. Morning to evening, all holy, holy, holy. No mistakes. I mean, Say something, you don't need anyone to rule over them. The people who are in authority uh, won't have much to do. What happens if in society suddenly all the murderers, all the wrongdoers, lawless people are suddenly changed? Just like in the Wales revival. Society was so affected, all the pubs were empty. Nobody is going there. Everybody going to church. Nobody is committing any crime. The policemen don't have any job to do. They could join a prayer meeting though. But you can imagine, when everybody do, does right, the need of authority is lessened. Because everybody knows their boundary, know their limits. So the true test of authority is when a mistake is made. The true test of the function of authority is when there are error, iniquities, shortcomings, mistakes. How it is done, how it is dealt with, is a test of authority. Both on the one who exercises it and the one who submits to it. Ham apparently has no respect for his father. His father was in authority. When his father made a mistake, he laughed, he mocked, he sneered, all implying the Hebrew word. And he told others, all these are expressions of someone who does not respect authority. Now here is the hardest thing. What must they do? Good thing we have an example of Shem and Japheth. Shem and Japheth took the opportunity to cover up their father. Now we are not talking about covering up sin. But we are talking about how sins have to be dealt in its context. It's the Bible which says, Love covered a multitude of evil. You remember that phrase? Love covered, covers a multitude of evil. 
There's a New Testament equivalent that we can look at. That's in the book of 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5. In verse 17 onwards, it says, Let the elders who rule well be accounted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture says, You shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not... Uh, look at verse 19. Do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses. Those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all that the rest also may fear. Now Paul qualifies about dealing with those who are in authority. How do we respond to authority? When those in authority make mistakes, how do we respond? Now, how we respond is going to determine how we ourselves will use authority in the future. Ham responded wrongly, and that tells you that Ham is someone who, when he has authority, is going to abuse it. You could tell the seeds of rebellion and abuse from that one act. Of course, First Timothy chapter 5 is qualified by Matthew chapter 18. But Jesus says, first you tell the person direct, then you get two or three, and then followed by a, a, a multitude. Right? So, uh, Paul is following the same example. You see, do not receive an accusation except there be two or three witnesses. That means they must have got the two or three witnesses together with the, with the person concerned first. And then if it was true, when a person does not listen or repent, then only it was brought to the open. So here we are looking at the function of authority and those things that are involved. Why are we looking into it? Because remember we are talking about three types of authority and how it comes. Number one, inherited authority. Number two, delegated authority. Number three, acquired authority. Now, in order to move into all three, inherited authority, there's nothing you can do about that is determined by God. Romans chapter 12 and Ephesians chapter 4. The gifts and the callings of God are by His grace, by His gifting. There's not much that you can do about the inherited authority. In other words, God dispenses to, uh, a gift to each man, uh, except that you will learn how to function in it, which we will cover in this course uh, as, as time and as God permits. So there's not much you can do about getting it. It's by grace. It's determined by God. Just discover it. That's our only thing you can do about it. The only thing you can do is discover it. Where God placed you. What kind of authority has placed you in? Flow into it. Delegated authority, right, is something that you could do about. But delegated authority comes in the New Testament after a quiet authority. Example in Acts 6, right? They first, they already have number one, inherited authority. Then they were good at the number three, acquired authority. They were of good reputation, the seven deacons. And then they had number two, appointment. And after that, their ministry exploded. Took off in God. Any area of ministry... And in the whole of the kingdom of God, you will always have some people you submit to and some people whom you relate to. There is never a place where there is no authority we submit to and, and uh, where we are not exercising some form of authority. We will always be a little brick in God's building. Finding our place, know who is a brick next to you on your left, brick next to you on the right, who is a brick on top of you, who is a brick right down there who is helping you to stand right where you are. They are all little bricks to build the house of God. The reason we are looking at that is because there is a lot that we can do about the area called acquired authority. If you have inherited authority but it doesn't develop in your life, 
doesn't grow in your life and uh, the acquirement is not demonstrated it may live and die with the seed not grown not planted the plant died in its infant stage how do we grow that? it starts in the home it starts in the family and uh, that home could be a wider circle wider circle of friends maybe if you live away from your family live with your friends even if you uh, share tenancy with two or three other brothers and sisters do you know automatically somebody will be the head somebody will end up the chief tenant sure there is, there is no such thing as equal tenants and uh, in a sense that not everybody is equal and then there are some decisions to make nobody nobody makes it never there is always a someone who is overall that's the principle of God and so we emphasize that authority as we look at these three authorities authority begins in the home Paul requires and he emphasizes that and we do not want to neglect the emphasis it begins in the home how you train your children and how you yourself respond to your own fathers and mothers all of us have, if we are married, we have, uh, you know, uh, children. If we are not married, we have brothers and sisters and we have a uh, family. Even if we are married, we also see our brothers and sisters and we have a uh, father and mother unless they have gone home to be a lot or they have, uh, they have died long ago. How do we relate to our father and our mother if they are alive? That's the important. How do you li- relate to your elder brothers, your younger brothers or, or your family? All these will determine how you function in church authority, in spiritual authority. Because if we don't function in our home authority, we will be powerless, or rather our power is rendered ineffective when we face the enemy. When we face the enemy, there will be an area where, where we, we try to function and we cannot flow. Sometimes it's in the ministry. God can call you. God can have a special gifting in your life. And you're flowing. Perhaps you are uh, uh, an evangelist, let's say, example. And you're flowing in an area or soul winner. And you're flowing in your gift, a tremendous person. But you do not know how to flow in authority in your own home. You do not know the limits and extent of it. You will find that when your ministry takes off, it reaches a plateau and it never goes on further. You always end up going round and round in that wilderness, in the plateau. Never progressing. Your ministry reach a certain stage and stop. Reach a certain stage and stop. Reach a certain stage and stop. Over and over again. And you try to move beyond it, you can't. Until you break that hole on you in your home. It takes a long while for some of us to do it. But we must break it. That authority how it functions in the home begins in the home right uh, having a look at that area we will go to a third area tonight on how these three areas of authority need to be maintained the area where they will be challenged right the primary area of authority in maintaining is the character of the one who carries the authority Authority and character are twins. If a person has authority but no character, the authority will after some time not be respected and no one will listen to that, to, to that authority anymore. No one will pay heed to the authority. Because behind authority is quality of character. Say for example, uh, the police force, okay? Let's take a natural illustration. If the police are righteous, honest, fearful of God, and obedient to their commands, right to the door, what do you think will happen? The citizens of the country will respect the police. Right? 
when you see them, you know they're honest, they're good, wonderful. You, you gain a respect for the authority. But what happens when, let's say, uh, police are not honest? Let's say when they take bribes. Let's say when they do wrong things. What will happen? The respect that people have to yield to the authority is deteriorated. It deteriorates. After some time, nobody will want to listen anymore. So authority is tied up to quality of character. The reason why we all love Jesus and we still can submit Him endlessly, eternally, is because of the quality of His character. That is the reason why when Paul talks about spiritual authority and spiritual positions in the church, he lists all the qualifications in 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy and Titus. All of them, you look carefully, has to do with character. All of them have to do with character. Person's character, the temper, the temperance, the love, the gentleness, the hospitality. All these are uh, characters, they're character requirements, honesty, integrity. You never find him mentioning a single thing about the, the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit or, or things like that or how long they pray, although those are important too. But you find him mentioning about the character. Why? Because the character of a person will, will always be necessary to maintain whatever level of authority a person has. And here's a deep key. To develop a greater realm of spiritual authority, develop more Christ-likeness. The more Christ-like you become, which is the goal of God in our lives, at any place that you're placed in authority, the only limit will be God, who sets you a stage at a time. But the limit won't be your character anymore. Your character will stand firm at any stage. Develop Christ-likeness. That's an important ingredient. Without that, you will never have respect. You see, some people, when they have authority, they use the authority like a pharaoh. You know what happens? You will have obedience, but no respect. But actually, it's not obedience. You have unwilling submission, momentary, uh, for a moment. Then you could oppress your own family and your kids until they won't talk. They won't say anything. So you have a very quiet home. You say you have your family in obedience. But not exactly. You are like a army commander attention all attention and uh, it, they look very obedient but the obedience is not from the inside out it's from the outside trying to get in and it never because the inside is hurt and uh, one day it, it will all come out uh, like a balloon bursting and the whole outward form will just burst off it's like a balloon why? because Authority needs quality for authority to be respected. The most important thing about uh, authority is that it be respected. If no one respects the authority, how can submission come? How can submission come at all? And there's no point trying to get submission without respect. Forget it. Which is why, you know, although this course sounds so... so so doctrinal, you know, spiritual authority and church structure. People look at the cross right then already. But it's important because there are too many people using spiritual authority who have not earned respect. And that's dangerous. You will get a measure of submission to the authority, but that submission is not going to be fruitful. The submission must come voluntarily. People must submit because they love to submit. 
People must submit because they have a choice not to submit and choose to submit. People must not submit just because they got no alternative alternative. They have to. I mean, even God Almighty wants our submission voluntarily. We are so free we could have chosen and go to hell, burn eternally in hell, which God doesn't want, and yet He gives us the free choice. Why? He wants submission because we have come to respect Him and love Him. That's the kind of true spiritual authority that we need to look at and understand. And God wants character. Now we're going to see here in the Bible, when spiritual authority fails, it's always a failure of character. How sad. Let me show a few examples. Right? First Samuel. First Samuel. Chapter 8, verse 1. First Samuel chapter 8, verse 1. Now it came to pass when Samuel was old, that he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn was Joel, Joel, and the name of his second, Abijah. They were judges in Bathsheba. But his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after this honest gain, took bribes and perverted justice. Is it Samuel delegated authority to his son? The failure was not because Samuel delegated. The Israelites never complained that that they didn't like it because it was his son. The complaint has nothing to do with his son. It could have been his sons, it could have been his relations, it could be his uh, uncles or grand aunt or whatever. It could be a totally unrelated person. They have no problems with the relationship of Samuel and his sons, the blood relationship. Some people will have a problem though. But they have no problems with that. The only problem was the character of their the son, they said. Why the son took bribes? The children of Samuel took bribes. And we have already shared the story of how we believe uh, why, why Samuel had that problem. Is it Samuel himself never have a good home? You can see there that Samuel never had a good home. His mother was Hannah. His father was Elkanah. And Elkanah had another wife called Penina. And they had thrived in their home. His real home has thrived. When he was a young boy, he was given or adopted away to the Lord and brought up by the high priest. High priest name? Anybody? Eli. Right? Eli. And Eli was not a very good priest. Horrible priest. Did not keep the Lord's commandment. His sons commit adultery in the tabernacle and Samuel grew up in that kind of atmosphere you can see why I emphasize on family now you cannot blame the family you came from you didn't choose your family but your parents you know were the one who, who brought you into being you, you didn't choose your parents none of us have a choice to choose our parents none of us have a choice in those areas there's nothing you can do about that, but there's something you can do about your relationship. I, I was not brought up in a proper home. My parents were strict, but it's more the Chinaman strictness. My father and mother never played with me. We, I never got any hearts at all. But I don't have to grow up that way, because I have the Lord Jesus. I hug my kids a lot, kiss them a lot, play with them a lot, come down to their level. But that had to be removed in my life. And then I had to establish a relationship with my father and with my mother, even when I was in the ministry. Let me tell you, God dealt with me in those areas. 
When I went back home, God dealt with me. You, you must do it. You must do it. You must do it. And I mean, the Holy Spirit can really get at you when He wants. And until I went back and stood before my father and said, Pa, I call him Pa. He's now with the Lord. And he said, I love you. Imagine, I had to wait until I was 19 years old to tell him I love him. Why? Because he never told me he loved me. Of course, we all know we love each other. But God dealt with that. And then with relationships, He dealt with, dealt with that. With, with my mother. And now we have good relationships. Very good relationships. And uh, it was not easy. It was not easy. But God dealt with me. And uh, imagine when it was, you know, uh, very, very late in my life before I ever gave my mother a kiss on the cheek. Anybody here have never kissed their parents? Uh, so I'm not the only one. I can, I, I can assure you it is not easy. Isn't it remarkable? It's easy yet not easy. And, you know, after one day when I was sharing with my mother when visiting and and I don't visit them very often. The first five years of ministry, I hardly see them at all. That's later that I was able to do that. And uh, when we are saying goodbye, you know, I have come to that level where we have re-established so great a relationship with uh, my mother and with all my other family members and brothers and my sisters that uh, it just seemed so natural. Before I left, I gave her a kiss on the cheek. She looked stunned. But something happened inside. See, we learn these kind of things in the home before we learn it outside. The home is where you practice. Now, of course, you know, we're married with our own family. Some of us have our own family members. You have your home to practice in. The character. So we know Samuel's problem, his past. We cannot do anything about our past in the sense of we cannot change it, but we can sort of learn to relate to it in a proper way. But the point that is here is that the Israelites were willing to accept his son, but they could not respect their sons because of their corruption. Therefore, when you cannot respect a person, you cannot submit to a person at all. Try submitting to someone you don't respect. Cannot. You just cannot. Even if you do it, it's very artificial. It's all, all you know, cat and mouse story. It's not real. Because the cat is there, the mice do that. You're not, you're, not, you're, you're not really submitting. You're just playing cat and mouse. If you ever do that, you repent because you're red. <laughs> cat and mouse game. One day the mouse trap will get you. <laughs> we are not mice. We are not red. We are sheep. Born again of the blood of Jesus Christ. So let's learn this art of respect and submission in authority. Those in authority need to learn how to gain the respect of those under them. Those under the authority need to learn how to relate to those in authority instead of keeping at a distance. Two-way flow. So the problem here was character. Now sometimes it's true, sometimes it's not true. Like in the case of Numbers chapter 12. Aaron and Miriam had a problem with submission to Moses. Let's look at Numbers chapter 12. It says here in verse 1 and 2, Then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married. For he had married an Ethiopian woman. Now this was not his second wife, this was his first wife. If you read carefully the early part in Exodus, that his wife was actually from the region of Ethiopia. Same wife. They never complained earlier, but now they complain. 
But behind their complaint was something else. They found it hard to submit to Moses. When they found it difficult, they find excuses. Excuses that are nothing to do, and it's important. It has nothing to do with the character. There's nothing about the character mentioned. I mean, the, the Ethiopian woman was probably a good woman. Didn't say that she did some wrong thing, she took dishonestly, or she did anything. No, nothing to do. Neither did Moses. So their complaint was not in the realm of, char- of character. Their complaint was because they just couldn't accept an Ethiopian. They are Israelites. Why can't he marry an Israelite? Why should he have chosen her? And if you read the book of Exodus story, you notice that you know, when Jethro came to meet Moses, it was then that Jethro brought Moses' wife. So apparently when Moses was in Egypt, his wife may not have you know, been with him. His wife, after circumcising his children, may, may have just you know, gone to be the father or either that. It's mentioned in the book of Exodus, all the stories, I hope you know. So, Aaron and Miriam never had a chance to really get to know Moses' wife. Besides that, Aaron and Miriam were much older than Moses. Moses was their ati. What is the young brother in Indian? Tambi. Okay. Moses was to them Tambi. They know when he was playing marbles, they were already working. Tambi was running all over the place. Now this Pambi became above them. It's not easy, folks, to submit. But they couldn't find any problem with the character because the Bible says he was a meek man. Their complaint was invalid reasoning. Not acceptable. Now I wanted to see how it was dealt with. God dealt with that situation. And here is where those in authority need to understand that as long as your character is like God, all authority will at a certain time or other have complaints and criticism. Right? At all times, certain places, certain times, they will be. But as long as there's nothing to do with sin, as long as it has nothing to do with your character flaw, learn to be like Moses. Every time something happened, he fell on his face before God. Do you know why? Because the one who, whom he inherited the authority from, who helped him to acquire the authority, who had delegated authority to him, is responsible to establish his authority. Okay? No one is required regarding spiritual authority. We are not required to establish our authority. God established our authority. We are only required to exercise faithfully the authority and the responsibility given to us. The work of establishing is always God. That's the art of learning spiritual authority. Sometimes people try to establish themselves and it works against them. Never do it. Some people go into the carnal area and try to establish themselves by carnal methods and they fail miserably. God never asks us to establish our authority. He only asks us to exercise our authority. Because if God puts you up, only God will remove you, not man. And the one who puts you up is the one who will protect you to be up there. That's an important lesson to learn. Why? Because anyone who has ever had any, any form of spiritual authority, whether little or great, will face situations where your authority is challenged. 
and authority will be challenged at different times. Let me assure you of this persecution. <laughs> Little or, or, or big. It will be challenged. But let God establish your authority. Let God use that to confirm that it has been delegated to you. Which is exactly what Moses did. And in all this, as we are looking at that first point, character, how important it is to authority, we need to close with the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12, chapter 10, excuse me. <clears throat> now here's the statement that Jesus made that we must pay attention to because authority, spiritual authority is different from natural authority and the way Gentiles organize it. Because if you miss this, you may miss the whole structure of the church when we cover that. This is the basis. Because a lot of mistakes are still being repeated today in church structure and spiritual authority because they neglect this statement by Jesus. In Matthew chapter 10, uh, Mark chapter 10, verse 42, But Jesus called them to himself and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. Now Jesus is making a statement about Gentile organization. Worldly organization. Carnal organization. And then he goes on to say verse 43 Yet it shall not be so among you. Can you see that word? Now let me analyze how Gentile authority functions. You see, Gentile authority has what we call strata. The laborer reports to the supervisor. The supervisor reports to the manager. The manager reports to the head of his department. Bigger department head. And you go on, it's strata. That system will always exist. You will find in the Bible, strata, uh, strata authority exists. But there is a difference. This is the main difference. In the world, you are not allowed a direct appeal. Now, some modern organizations have amended that. In other words, there is very great difficulty if you are right down the ladder. Laborer. Very difficult to approach the president, the CEO of the company. Cannot. Why? Because when you try, you refer back. Don't see me. Have you seen your supervisor? No. Nope. Get back. You try the manager. Manager say, have you seen the supervisor? Get back. And you're frustrated in the whole system. You're way down in the whole system. Your only alternative, resign and go to another job. If you're not happy. Now, I have seen it coming into church structure. Let me show a difference. Many churches organize their authority line into, for example, department heads or home fellowship heads or cell group heads or divisional heads. You are not allowed to approach the main guy, whether it be senior pastor or the main board people, without approaching through the strata. It is not in the Bible. It is from the world. And unless we change, that same system will be the death of the church. You can analyze in the New Testament. Okay? Let me analyze the New Testament. Notice that even though they have a system of leadership, the apostles were on top. Let's look at Jerusalem church. The apostles were on top. Then they have appointed other people under them. And under those people, they have many other leaders. You can be sure because by Acts 15, they got elders. Many various types of leaders. But you notice the difference. Everyone was treated on equal level when it comes to fellowship and approachability. On work level, it may be different. But here is where it, it comes in. There is nothing wrong with an organization which has a strata system for, for systematic flow. Okay? 
if you don't have organization like that, you cannot cannot run a uh, 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 hundred thousand people. You cannot you cannot control. If everything is centralized, you know, uh, you cannot control. I mean, it's not impractical. You're not God. You go only twenty four hours. How much can you do? And how many people can you talk to in twenty four hours if you don't sleep? Only God is able to run a centralized headquarters. Not man, because God neither sleep nor slumber. Plus, God is omnipresent. There's not enough. He divides himself into several. So we all can approach him at the same time. So because we are not God, we cannot do that. There will be some strata system, but the difference is this. Anybody within the strata system should be able to approach right to the top. There should be accessibility. The, the strata system is for running things, not for approachability. That's where the Gentiles got it wrong. And so we still can have home fellowships, we still can have self growth, but approachability must be, must be there. In other words, when we, for example, run this church, uh, the structure, right? Anybody could see me, that's all. Of course, being a human being and not God, who have limited time, then, you know, people would make appointments and then just, just come in to be practical, right? Instead of seeing me at 2, 2 a.m. in the morning, right? So we put it and slot it in the right time. But the approachability is there. See the difference? The approachability is there. Even though they may have never seen another guy, uh, the, 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 uh, the head in the home fellowship, even though they may not have seen the head in their department, the approachability is there. That we need to maintain. And the same with any subsection of leadership in church structure. It must be on a one-to-one basis. If there's any organization, right, in, uh, you know, uh, uh, counseling times, etc. It's more for practical purposes. Because we are human beings, not God. We have limited time. But that's an important consideration. And we look at the New Testament structure that uh, Peter was, you know, any, any zombie or heretic could approach Peter if they could catch him anywhere around. Which, you know, in one group when he was at one uh, place called uh, Lystra, they, they got him there. Staying at a place, you know, uh, there. And Cornelius, you know, God approached to him straight away. They, they found him there by supernaturally. By the leading of, uh, of uh, the angel that told Cornelius what to do. So how does that go about? That is, those in authority, here's the key, must be willing to come down right to the lowest level. Which is not something Gentiles in authority like to do. See, this is exactly what Jesus said. The Gentiles lord it over them. They are not willing to come down right to the lowest level and talk on an equal level. How many presidents of the uh, of large corporate corporation will be willing to just come down to the workers' level and be like a man to man to them? That's the key that Jesus is bringing up. Jesus Christ, who is the head of the universe under God the Father, came right down to the human race to express the authority that came from Him. That's the difference. Hands-on leadership, we call it. In other words, you're willing to come right down to the bottom level. To relate not as, you know, a lord over them, hello, I'm the lord here, but to relate as human being to human being. Brothers and sisters in the Lord. That's the kind of authority that will gain what Jesus says, respect. Now, in, modern, uh, mo- in the modern world and in modern organization, you find that sometimes an organization out there has that kind of leadership. I mean, some companies, their head or their bosses, come right down. And you know, all those employees love that company. They find easy to work and they have job satisfaction. You know why? Because of that, they practice Jesus' principle. Came right down to the level. And that's the kind of authority that Jesus wants to establish in the church. We should be able to come right down to those people at that level. The level where they live. 
And that is the key to earn what you say the most important thing in authority, respect. Respect. You could come right down and show people how to do it. How to start it off. Right at their level. When respect is there, authority is there. But do you know in the world, people are afraid to do that because they think the opposite, that they, it will make them lose respect. And that it will, you know, sort of uh, lessen their authority and their effect on them. But trust Jesus saying, Jesus says, you shall not be like the Gentiles, but the greatest among you shall be a servant of all. And he himself came down, put on a loincloth, and washed his disciples' feet to the shock of his disciples. Think about that. To the shock of his disciples. Watch his disciples say, oh, well, how? Peter could not, you know, he was a flabbergaster. He didn't know what to say. Say, Lord, how can you do this to me? Shock. Because Jesus came down to that level. But they had more respect for Jesus after that. They had more love for Jesus after that. That's how Jesus wants us to exercise spiritual authority. Whatever level of spiritual authority you have at the moment, whether you have acquired or delegated or you inherit it from God in your talents and your gifting, it is important that whomever and whoever you exercise authority over, you must have been, quote-unquote, with them. If you have not been with them at their level, there's no way you can exercise preacher authority. You can only exercise carnal authority, like the Gentiles. Lordship. Not servantship. Which Jesus Christ tells us to exercise in preacher authority. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we praise you and we thank you for your grace and your mercy to us tonight. And Father, as we learn to grow in preacher authority, these things that are important, O oh God, because as we grow in you, as our offices and ministries expand, as our gifts become recognized in the local body, in the, in, the, in the universal body, we will gain spiritual authority and impact. We pray, O oh God, that you would teach us how to flow and function in spiritual authority. That we will flow in the fullness of it, O oh God. That we will grow to be established in that authority you call us to. So, Father God, tonight, let your grace of God be established in our lives. And we yield the establishment of authority to you. We recognize it's not us who could do it, but you, O oh God. So, Father, we just commit ourselves to you tonight and ask that you grant us wisdom to exercise authority understanding of God and large our hearts to have love to have mercy thank you God we worship you at this time and give you all glory praise and honor in Jesus name Amen praise God let's stand and sing He is Lord He is Lord He is Lord of all authority He is Lord he is Lord He is risen from the dead And He is Lord Every knee shall bow Every tongue come that Jesus Christ is Lord. Praise God. Let Jesus declare offering. God bless you.